So COVID presented not an opportunity, but an insight for parents to understand mm. and parents and teachers to understand that online learning is a new way of life. Yeah, hello everyone, and today I am your host Dorothy, and we are back with another episode of Questions with Quest. So, to, in today's episode, we'll be interviewing our guests who are disrupting the edtech industry in Singapore and Indonesia, and are evolving the way children learn, giving them the opportunity to get the best education possible from the comfort of their homes. Mm. Our special guests are none other than Raven Ho, CEO and founder of um, EdTech, along with Alila Syed, head of partnerships of EdTech as well as Annabelle Tan, head of HitsQuest. So thanks for being here with us, uh, Raven and Adela. So can you help our listeners learn more about yourself? So firstly, did you grow up in Singapore? Yes, I am a pure Singaporean. I grew up in Singapore studying the Singapore system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at a young age of 17, I acknowledged that we benefited a lot from the Singapore educational system. Mm -hmm. So through the Singapore education system, we actually are able to come from very um, low social economic status and you can progress through a proper education system and graduate from the university. Mm -hmm. That allows anyone in Singapore to have pure meritocracy. So as a result, I felt that actually education system in Singapore could or should be replicated uh, easily while in Singapore. So I started venturing into education Mm -hmm. at the age of 20 years old. So I started running tuition school, uh, which later evolved into running curriculum for international school in overseas Mm -hmm. and eventually realized that technology could do more in education. So as a result, in 2016, I ventured into education technology, Mm -hmm. imbruing both technology into the education system in hope to benefit more students at ease and at easier cost. Okay. So um, did you start with like the A-levels program? I started working on the IGCSE syllabus. I started with the GCSE, which is a Singapore-based mm. curriculum, right? And, and realized that it's not a scalable model. Yeah. Then I started doing the IGCSE mm-hmm. and helped train kids to do more IGCSE curriculum mm. outside of Singapore. Okay. But I realized it's still not very scalable because it, it is on the teacher's training, teacher's aspect, and, and teachers are scarcity. Good teachers are hard to find. Mm. And I always think that if technology can help take over some of the tasks and the load from teachers mm-hmm. it will benefit not just the teachers themselves but the students themselves definitely mm. yeah what about you guys so you grew up in Singapore as well mm, yeah I did grow up in Singapore studied in Singapore okay yeah so actually having to venture overseas is quite a <laughs> good <laughs> challenge and mm. uh, eye opener okay I'd say yeah so I think I was in sustainability before as well as in some aspect of teaching. Yeah. So I guess being in this is actually marrying both sustainability and education, mm-hmm. which I think it's quite impactful yeah. for society. What about you, Adila? Um, I actually grew up in Bangladesh and um, wow. I, uh, yeah, so I moved over to Singapore when I was about 14. Yeah. So I split my educational life between Bangladesh and mm. Singapore. and. Um, I think slightly different from Raven. I was never really quite happy with my educational <laughs> journey in either country. Mm-hmm. And um, I think for me, it was a lot about, uh, you know, how stressful the both the systems were, mm-hmm. how exam-focused both the systems were. So I think, uh, you know, from a very young age, I was very angry at mm-hmm. the kind of education that I was getting. Okay. And, um, you know, it was mostly to do with the stress and the overwhelming uh, importance of just doing exams and just doing well in exams. Mm. So um, I think, you know, from a very young age as well, I started to venture out and started to, uh, you know, volunteer from mm. the age of 15. You know, volunteered across different educational institutions, yeah. um, across nonprofits. And, you know, I've just, uh, you know, we try to make it a mission in my life. So make education more fun mm-hmm. for children and you know um, essentially that's where uh, you know I am at right now I'm trying yeah. to make education more fun yeah. for children as well 
That's very interesting that like you have more of a push factor of like trying to change education whereas Raven has more of a pull factor like trying to make it better and trying to give everyone else that equal opportunity. Mm. Yeah, okay. And then was there a specific experience from maybe um, growing up in the education system or once you all were entering like volunteering for Adila or for yourself when you were doing um, tuition was it? Yep. Yeah. That really shaped the way that you perceived learning. And how did this eventually contribute to your vision for ITEC? Yeah. Mm. Um, I always believe in Singapore, I grew up learning road learning. Okay. Right? So I had to memorize tons and tons of theory yeah. um, and formulas mm-hmm. without actually understanding it. Mm. Um, that actually is a hindrance to creativity. Yes. Uh, so in secondary school, I spent many hours purely working on my memory skills okay. just to memorize theory and to answer 10 year series based questions so when I was in A level I realized that skill set is totally useless mm. uh, it's, it's not going to exist and you will never pass an exam if you just continue to do that yeah. so I realized learning should be changed and the way to learn should be many sensorial Depends on what mm. individual needs. If you are a kinesthetic person, yeah. or you're an audio person, yeah. or you're a sens- sensory, or you need to see things, then you can understand. Mm-hmm. So different kids learn different way. Uh, however, there were not much technology in Brew in our time mm. to allow us to understand. Yeah. There weren't even YouTube to begin with. There weren't even Google in my era. Mm. Google started with me when I was in university year two. Oh. And I had to use a 56k down in modern, which breaks <laughs> once in a while to find content oh. outside of Singapore. Yeah. So I realized technology can be a lot more interesting to be improved into into learning if mm. the kids can open the heart virtually, yeah. Yeah. break it into parts. Yeah or actually see the blood flow mm-hmm. and they can they don't really need to memorize it mm-hmm. they understand oh yeah it flows this way mm-hmm. so therefore I I really think learning with technology can help kids move on especially later part of my life I thought kids can learn by pure discussion yeah yeah pure <laughs> discussion can allow anyone to learn mm. without purely memorizing it. Mm. So I actually invented a pedagogy in my early days called Research, Discuss and Practice mm-hmm. when I was training the kids to learn. Mm-hmm. I always teach them how to research for things, yeah. to discuss with me and to discuss with their peers mm-hmm. and then practice it on their own. Yeah. Right? So I realized actually that research, discuss can be further enhanced if I take over an AI and a VR, AR mm-hmm. to overcome this aspect okay. right kids okay. can research faster yeah. they can understand faster yeah. they can discuss with an AI faster yeah. and then they can practice exam paper with an AI mm-hmm. based question right okay. and then if you really don't understand yeah. you can talk to the teachers uh-huh. and the teachers can help you overcome okay. that gap so it's a lot of active learning it's a lot of repetition but at the same time application to really exactly right that because approach. that's life yeah. right because yeah. in life especially where you left school for yeah. so many years there's no teacher mm. right nobody is going to tell you this is the right way yeah please get this way and then you have this way and then this way there's no such person mm. especially when you're running a startup nobody will <laughs> tell you step one do this step two mm. you do this there's no teacher right yeah. probably there will be mentor mm-hmm. and there's some people along the way to guide you yeah. but there's nobody to teach you right mm-hmm. so the life skills of research of what is happening mm. discuss it with people oh. and then execute it okay. so I think this is where I benefited the most and therefore it is it is where I think act tech should help students grow yeah especially in this aspect yeah wow okay I have a very clear picture of like how you saw act tech so early on and I see thank you sort of <laughs> that's cool okay and uh, what about for you guys? Did you have like a very specific experience that maybe influenced how you see your role in EdTech now? <laughs> um, okay, I think for me, like like I mentioned, right, yeah. I grew up pretty angry at the education that I was getting. Yeah. Um, so about 2017, I was running a non-profit enrichment mm-hmm. centre. Okay. 
and you know I I had a very great opportunity to go over to Denmark yeah. for a UNSDG uh, innovation lab oh. called uh, Unleash, okay. and I think um, you know that. Really changed the way I saw education and the way I saw uh, my own agency. Mm. So I think you know, growing growing up with a lot of anger, a lot of emotions towards my education system, the yeah. the one that my brother was receiving, uh, you know, and the one that I was receiving. I think when I was in Unleash, uh, you know, I was exposed to multiple different um, systems of mm. thinking, uh, multiple different technologies that yeah. I could utilize. So. Mm-hmm. It it was really there where I I feel like I felt more empowered to actually um, do something about the, the mm-hmm. feelings that I had growing up and you know I was exposed to VR technology there mm-hmm. and um, I met up with some Danish companies uh, you know who were who were you know way ahead of uh, you know everyone else in using VR for education and I uh-huh. think that really changed my life and I I think you know I. I wanted to harness that technology. I wanted to harness technologies like VR, yeah. um, you know, immersive technology, so you know we can provide a better education and a more joyful and fun education mm. for children. Yeah, all right. Oh, so it really ties back to what Raven said just now about yeah. like that whole sensory experience and really just leaving an impact that's more than rock learning. Yeah. Okay. And just completely out of curiosity, how do you guys come up with the name Act? Uh huh. It's a very interesting question. Um, I always like to create a company with acronym. Yes. Yeah. So that it's easier to understand, right? Okay. And it, and then, um, so you have a slant of edutech, mm-hmm. um, but that was no be default of purposely, purposefully, <laughs> right? Uh, it was because I wanted to be like Google. Okay. Uh, Google have a simple statement, uh, mission statement, and the mission statement was to. Allow information to be found easily, yeah. or allow information to be disseminated easily, mm. right? So I think everything that they do was around around this mission statement, right? Okay. So my dream is to automate content. Mm. When I say automate content, means in any field, students or adult want to look for content, yeah, they just click and tag and boom. You have anything that you need to learn yeah. from this platform, right? Mm-hmm. So that was the intent of why we have AgTech automating content knowledge ah. for training, education, and commerce. Wow. Okay, it's a very really long acronym. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice that you have the EduTech. Right. It sounds so it sounds like well. AgTech. Yeah, it's very memorable. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then moving more into like the the EdTech space. So we all know it's a very competitive space with like both online and offline med, uh, models. So, what would you say would be the largest problem you've noticed so far in this space? So, EduTech is actually uh, existed twenty over years, mm. right? It was just not that hot twenty years ago. Mm-hmm. E-learning, computer-based training, mm. and tons and tons of of multiple choice question on a laptop yeah. was already there mm. when I was growing up as a young adult. Um, however, the education space uh, has also changed over the last 10 to 10 years. So I was growing up in the industry. I grew up soaring tuition centers sprouting up from Singapore, from Korea, from Hong Kong mm. and from China. Yeah. And I saw Enrichment centers training people from brain power, reading power, dancing power, music, etc. Right, and parents are flocking to send the kids to let the kids grow up, especially if if the country is slightly more affluent. Mm. Right, so online was never in existence mm. because nobody believed online would happen. Mm. So the best online was e-learning in adulthood, mm. where corporate banks. Aviation and even um, maybe construction areas, sophisticated ones, will give you e-learning. That is mm. about it. But why online was not prevalent then is because the understanding that kids can learn at their own home with a teacher who is in USA or a teacher who is in China to get his English lesson or get his Chinese lesson was never. Possible because yeah. technology was always dropping its link, and then when you talk to the person on the other end, you have a ten second lag. Mm. So until where Zoom came alive, 
and class in came alive mm. and where China ad tech flourished the market mm. people realized that actually edu tech is possible yeah. but it only happened in the part of this world which is yeah. in Asia Southeast Asia was not actually growing until COVID came yeah. so COVID presented not an opportunity but an insight for parents to understand Mm. And parents and teachers to understand that online learning is a new way of life, mm. and it is potentially higher chance yeah. than offline yeah. because the kids can jolly well sit at home after yeah. school and have tuition from somebody else. Mm. So the space is big. The things to do in edutech is about there. Either you have online tuition or you have K-12 learning or you have adulthood training, skills upgrading mm. or university placement. <laughs> this about it that you have seen in this market, mm. right? So we see the biggest challenge is every country, there are companies mimicking what other people are doing. Mm. Just like how Grab and ride-hailing companies were fighting in the earlier days. Yeah. So one biggest operational challenge we feel is how do you in the shortest time go to a sizable and then you be the market leader mm -hmm. in the next few countries and before you yeah. emerge e mm -hmm. eventually <laughs> acquire all this baby mm -hmm. into one. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's a f it's a time of game uh between a game between time yep. speed innovation and most important I call smart money mm. okay. right yeah and then how would you say um, AgTech so far has bridged this gap yeah. AgTech maybe I'll take the question because right. yeah, I think um, <laughs> we have been working very hard yeah. uh, changing from a service based company mm -hmm. to a product based company mm. uh, we grew up trying to provide services yeah. which was not scalable okay. then we became product based uh, two years yeah. this team has worked two years working on one single platform and on board now 70s, 80s partners yeah. onto the platform to do online asynchronous lesson we use up all our effort and resources and even the funding that we had Mm. in the earlier round mm. to do this mm. right and the good news is actually we have revenue to sustain us mm -hmm. so so we didn't we didn't die off <laughs> and we survive uh, one thing I would say we we persevered mm -hmm. on what we wanted to do yeah. uh, but it's not easy mm. uh, in, in educational startup company you potentially takes three to five years mm. before you bear any fruits okay Oh, oh, I see. And then how does attack continue to stay ahead? You want to take a question? Yeah. Oh. How do you continue to stay ahead? Hmm. Especially relative to all the other technology platforms trying to do something similar. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there is lots of different ways, right? And I think, uh, but I think one of the ways I can highlight is really trying to be on the ground with your customers. Mm like being connected to what your customers want, right? And being like obsessed with your customers, yeah. for example, right? So I think, you know, we have been doing, uh, you know, we have been communicating with the customers obsessively. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, as a as kids coach, right? We yeah. have, um, as any marketplace, we have two sides. So, you know, we have our sellers who are, you know, our partners and then we have buyers, which are usually parents, schools and students, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we have pretty successfully uh, been on the ground, been on touch with both these sides. Mm. And I think, you know, when you're on the ground, you hear things. You're on mm. the ground, you know, you don't have to wait for uh, McKinsey reports to come out to tell you what's the latest trend in yeah. tech and what the latest demands are, what people want. Mm. When you're on the ground, you get the information first and, you know, you listen to these people and you build for these people. And I think, you know, that's one of the ways that we're staying ahead. Mm. Do you have a specific story? Maybe I'm can share about like Kids Quest where like you are um, working with a customer specifically and then you learn of a struggle mm, I think 
I mean, besides knowing what's on the ground, we also try to innovate, right? Because yeah. sometimes they don't know what they don't know, yeah. right? So it's up to us to innovate and show them there's a new way of learning. Yeah. There's a new way to to do certain things. Mm. Yeah. So I think for one, like in terms of our uh, game fight lessons, mm-hmm. uh, boundaries have been pushed. Mm. We're exploring new stuff, and then when they actually do, like end users do actually view it, yeah. uh, they are actually quite impressed right yeah. and they actually engage for the engage mm-hmm. and they look forward to more um, creative and innovative um, products that we have as well so the age gap that you guys cater to would be 0 to 12 wow yeah. okay okay cool and uh, moving on further into Indonesia so why s- so you guys have recently started expanding into Indonesia why Indonesia specifically hey, you want to start with? <laughs> oh um Indonesia, well, I guess looking at the Southeast Asian market, it will be the biggest, yeah. right? The biggest market. So I would say we will have more opportunities there. Mm. And also, I think like looking at how, how uh, in terms of how they have advanced, they are actually mm. the most ready to actually adopt more mm. the edutech solutions. Mm. Yeah. So for you growing up in Singapore, how would you say the Indonesian um, education space is similar to Singapore? I would say they try to adopt a lot of Singapore's system. Okay. All right. So in a, in a way, they are becoming more like uh, Singapore in the past. I would say I think okay. Singapore system has also advanced into a lot more beyond yeah. curriculum and just world learning itself. Uh, but the Indonesian education system, I would say, uh, has become like a more structured mm. in a way. Yeah, so. <laughs> what about like mindsets and culture? Would you say the attitude towards um, of parents towards their children's education has that similar push? Yeah, definitely. I think parents okay. see the importance of education, yeah. especially with more, more of them um, with rising affluence right mm. so they see the importance of education and they do invest in their kids education mm. yeah what about the differences so were there like cultural shocks or like very stark things that you noticed and you faced as a challenge mm. no actually they are very welcoming of okay. um um curriculum yeah. outside of Indonesia okay. right so I think that's one uh, heartwarming thing yeah. and something that also allows us uh, also gives us the opportunity yeah. to go into the Indonesian market itself yeah. Um, yeah. what else <laughs> <laughs> maybe I add on a bit so um, I would say Indonesia is a pretty diverse country mm-hmm. because this country is big mm-hmm. right? it ranges from Sumatra yeah. to Java yeah. to Papua Mm. Sulawesi and Kalimantan. Yeah. So we know our game. We will not uh, conquer Indonesia all together. Mm. We look at the biggest pie yeah. where affordability and mindset of parents is the highest. So we focus on Java, mm. which is where Jakarta, Surabaya and Samarang yeah. is. Yeah. So we started this landscape and we asked ourselves this is about 20 million students mm-hmm. in Indonesia yeah. which is easily four times bigger than the Singapore population. Yeah. Itself presents a high opportunity. Definitely. So we look at it and ask ourselves can we take over all this 20 million plus kids? The answer is no because there are different tiers of lifestyle yeah. that they are in. Mm-hmm. They have the top 5% which mm-hmm. is the in the international school mm-hmm. and the bottom th- okay pardon me I, I please delete this. <laughs> the, the next 95% okay. right uh, with the 95% presents the opportunity where Kids Crash is working on. Mm. Why? Because curriculum is good in Indonesia now but I think Indonesian government is looking to go international. Mm. These students base will become the 20 to 35 years old mm. and you will become the largest population group mm. in 10 to 20 years. Mm-hmm. So, government are looking to internationalize these kids. Yeah. It presents an opportunity for us where we are getting content mm. from good content providers mm. around 
the world and from Singapore. Mm. We want to help embrace Indonesian students mm. to go international. Mm. And that is why we chose Indonesia. Okay. Next country is Vietnam. I see. And why Vietnam? Same mentality, Confucius mentality, kids must not lose from the starting point. Yeah. Followed by Indonesia, uh, Thailand and Malaysia. Yeah. Right. Then we'll look at Philippines and maybe Cambodia and Myanmar in the next round. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, I'm hearing a lot about education and helping people um, push forward regardless of their social economic class mm. and really uh, making that leap forward for the future generation. Yep. So it's a very good segue into our next section which should be on sustainability yep. and what uh, tech is doing in the in the sustainability space. So EdTech is a part of the Sustainable Impact Accelerator, also known as SIA for short, powered by Quest Ventures and the Singapore Centre for Social Enterprise Race. It is the first VC-backed accelerator for socially impactful enterprises in Asia. And so talking about sustainable social impact will be complete without looking at the main framework of this whole movement, which is the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So can you share more about um, some goals that EdTech is actively trying to tackle? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we are, uh, uh, you know, no surprise to anyone trying to tackle SDG 4, which mm. is, um, you know, quality education. Yes. And, uh, oh, and 8. Yes. <laughs> 4 and 8. 8 is uh, decent, decent. Uh, decent work and economic growth, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, these are definitely, um, you know, the ones that we're trying to tackle. And I think, you know, the, the way we do it is that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I think we all believe that any education company is, you know, cannot be, um, cannot be uh, removed from mm-hmm. the whole idea of sustainability mm-hmm. and social impact, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, you know, we, the marketplace that we built, Kids Quest, mm-hmm. has access to so many different great content for children mm-hmm. at, you know, very, very affordable prices yes. so that, um, you know, children across the board in the region can have access to you know, quality dance lessons, quality art lessons, yeah. um, you know, enrichment lessons uh, from academics all the way to, um, you know, physical literacy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we are trying to give um, students, uh, despite, you know, any kind of like economic barriers, access to these. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, uh, as a company as well, we try to uh, empower people in terms of their skill sets too. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, one of the ways we do it is that we actually developed our own course with um, IT. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that course actually enables people. Uh, people to actually learn how to digitize themselves and we mm-hmm. upgrade their skills and you know provide them with um, you know more economic uh, mm-hmm. opportunities as well so you know I think um, sustainability and uh, uh, and really social impact is very very close to our heart and it's embedded in the business models that we have mm-hmm. I can definitely see that yeah and the active um, push towards um, increasing meritocracy um, throughout the region mm-hmm. as well maybe uh, can I add something yeah of course so Mm. For the longest time, um, we as a edutech company um, has constantly remind ourselves that we are not just a company to make profit. Yep. As an edtech company, there is also a need to make an impact. Mm. So the greatest impact that an education can make it will be helping one grow from mm. is social yeah. economic status, right? Yeah. And it starts from young. Mm. And the reason why we are happy that we participate in the accelerator yeah. because I think it's, it's, it's a good time now where ad tech companies should always be reminded that they also have a social cause mm. to yeah. do yeah. other than just making money. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. It's about more than just the student it's about shaping them into like a learner yes 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 and okay coming back to the ad tech industry so something that Raven shared just now that I thought was really interesting was um, the role of Zoom and and the pandemic and really highlighting the potential that online learning has for this entire space so according to Global Newswire the ad tech industry is bound to be valued over USD 100 billion by 2022 However, according to my research, there are also various challenges that are present, like the high cost of processing such content and budget restrictions. So what would you say are the biggest operational challenges that maybe KidsQuest or EdTech um, has faced or is currently facing? Yeah. Yeah, I think. 
<laughs> okay. Um, the space is crowded. Okay. Yeah, and VCs are not uh, um, are not at the most interested in edutech now. Okay. In this space, mm-hmm. um, not at anyone's fault. First, at macro reasons, and also at um, they are more sexiest tech compared to ad tech. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Whoever invests in an ad tech company has to like education mm. and must have a passion to like education. Yeah. So what happened is um, we as a ad tech company, um, the biggest challenge is not just about money. It's also about how do you reach out mm-hmm. to a foreign land yeah. as a Singaporean. Mm-hmm. That's our biggest curse. And I've been telling the whole world. <laughs> as a Singapore startup, right? If you tell people your market size is Singapore, yes. nobody will be interested in doing <laughs> it. If you tell people your market size is Indonesia, they were like, great. Can you explain to me how are you going to go there as a Singaporean dude like you? What is your plan? How are you going to execute it? Mm. Because they know you are not Indonesian. Mm. You don't have Indonesian network. Yeah. You don't have backings. Yeah. So how are you going to do business in Indonesia? Yeah. So therefore, when we went to Indonesia, the biggest challenge was how do we land ourselves well and grow traction mm-hmm. and and prove that edu, edu tech is a good industry to be in mm. and it actually it can make a difference in people's life. Mm. So one of the challenges that we we as a team made yeah. was <laughs> proving to our partners our content partners proving to our VCs who has backed us yeah. and proving to the rest of the Singapore companies yeah. that actually it can be done mm. but it, it comes with a lot of pain and blood <laughs> and sweat <laughs> yeah. which you have definitely put in so far yeah. to be able to get attacked the way the, the, the way it is right now yeah do you think um uh, SIA specifically had any contribution in where you guys are um, definitely. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Crest Venture yeah. and Race for accepting us into the accelerator. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not just about uh, getting access to understand more VCs and network. I think what is important about this accelerator, which I thought is good, is it helped to keep us in the mind frame that social impact is important. Mm-hmm. How do you constantly measure it? Mm-hmm. How do you work on it? Mm. And as a result, actually, we we are looking at it uh, very closely, uh, ensuring that as we do our uh, traction and engagement, we will continue to ensure that this social impact mm. mindset is in print mm. uh, and measure this impact yeah. so that we can really benefit more people. Yeah. So, thankful that Quest has taken the initiative to work with Race yeah. uh, and with Quest um, support mm. and more support. <laughs> <laughs> we hope the, we can fly the flags higher. Yes, yeah. definitely. Thank you. Huh. Alright, and then um, lastly, so we suddenly need more entrepreneurs like both of you who are driven to make a sustainable impact. Three of us. Yes. Make the successful instrument like three of us. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So can all three of you share a few words to <laughs> for aspiring founders who hope to do likewise? Anyone? Yeah. You all suffer, sir. Yeah. I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think very simply put, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Yeah. <clears throat> um make mistakes and then apologize later. <laughs> <laughs> Just go do it, you know yes. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say um, get a good mentor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely had one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Mine's a little bit different. Okay. Um, to be an entrepreneur, it really depends on the different phase of life that you're at. Yeah. yeah. If you had it earlier, um, it's okay to fail a few things. Mm-hmm. Right. If you had it later on in your life, it's still okay to fail, but it's harder to get up. Mm. Right. Especially when you are in 40s, mm-hmm. where you have commitments and families. Mm. Failure is okay. Don't get me wrong. It's just that if you fail, it's harder for you to move on. Mm. And therefore, you have to be always be on your toes yeah. to ensure every step that you take is calculated. Mm. And one thing that kept me alive all these years is the belief in your vision mm. that you want to do, mm. right? And be nice to people. Mm-hmm. Take care of the team. Yeah. Um, and a lot, a lot of grit. Mm. A lot of grit. And because there are more crying times, painful times than happy times. Mm. The happy times comes in after many rounds of brutal <laughs> failing, yeah. falling down. Yeah. And you still have to persevere mm. towards that. I guess many people gave up. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So now my favorite mantra <laughs> is TTT. <laughs> right? Things take time. Yes. Don't rush. Mm. Yeah. Survive is more important than any other thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys. For thank sharing. you. I'm your host Dorothy, and once again, thank you guys for tuning in to Questions with by Quest Ventures. This episode was recorded in Pixel, an incubation and innovation space by IMDA. For more information, visit impixel.imda.gov.sg.